Well, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Mangala Bharati, uh, who's a professor of neonatology at Madras Medical College. Uh, he will be speaking about the clinical aspects of uh, CPAP in general. Dr. Mangala Bharati is also the head center of excellence of newborn Institute of uh, Obstetric and Gynecology, uh, Chennai, India. Dr. Mangala Bharati, over to you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Vinod. Uh, greetings from India and uh, Chennai. Thanks again. Uh, it's my pleasure to discuss the clinical aspects of uh, CPAP uh, in this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm a faculty heading an 80 bedded uh, NECU, one of the largest NECUs uh, of uh, India, the southernmost uh, part of uh, India at Chennai. So, uh, in, uh, to understand the CPAP, uh, most of us know CPAP is a respiratory support device. The name stands for a continuous positive airway pressure where with the help of a machine uh, both during uh, the phases of inspiration and expiration throughout the respiratory cycle uh, a small amount of uh, pressure is delivered continuously unlike a mechanical ventilation where uh, we give uh, two kinds of pressures uh, a higher pressure during inspiration to inflate the lung and then a lower kind of pressure during expiration so in short so the, this is a non-invasive mode of ventilation. So we don't need to intubate the patients using an endotracheal tube. Uh, and the pressure is delivered continuously throughout the respiratory cycle. So the obvious question is that, uh, okay, so why uh, we talk a lot about uh, this intervention uh, CPAP here? So you have a famous quote from uh, Professor Alan Job. See, uh, he has written that there is perhaps nothing more dangerous for a preterm lung than an anxious physician with an endotracheal tube and a bag. I think uh, this statement highlights well the fact that uh, a preterm baby's lung is so fragile. And uh, so in the common belief that uh, the lung requires the maximum support, uh, most of the clinicians tend to uh, do what we call as an invasive ventilation, intubate them immediately and start them on uh, assisted ventilation. But that process may be the uh, one of the most dangerous ones because it may cause a long lasting damage. What kind of damage are we talking about? Just see what, what is shown in this uh, picture is an electron microscopic picture of the lung. What you see are the alveoli there. So this is uh, not a good alveoli. See, a normal uh, picture should be full of alveoli. What you see here are only a few alveoli uh, so with a lot of thickened uh, uh, intraalveolar septum there and uh, see uh, the amount of space available for gas exchange here is much less and there is a lot of uh, inflammation happening very thick and altered alveoli so this is the end result if we use invasive mechanical ventilation on a preterm lung the reasons are many maybe because of the pressure what we use that's called as a barotrauma and uh, the repeated movement of a volume in and out of the lungs the volume can cause damage to the lung, what is called as a volume trauma. And also, there is repeated opening and closure of some alveoli in the lung. That's what we call as an atelectrotrauma. And of course, the presence of a foreign body, the endotracheal tube, uh, leads to a lot of inflammatory reactions because it's a foreign body. That's called as a biotrauma. So, all these kinds of trauma uh, can be negated if we can move to the CPAP. That's why we call uh, CPAP as a magic intervention. See, uh, what it does is that actually the CPAP just helps the baby who is having a difficulty in opening up uh, his or her lung. So this pressure helps in keeping the alveoli open throughout the respiratory cycle and then leaves the breath to the baby. So baby starts, with, it makes the breathing easy. So and the alveoli or uh, the collapse of the alveoli is prevented. So the alveoli always remain open and the baby starts breathing on its own continuously on top of this pressure. So uh, all these kinds of trauma, what we enlisted in the previous slide, uh, they're all out here. And uh, also a very less amount of pressure is required. And of course, uh, there is no foreign body here in the form of an uh, endotracheal tube. And obviously, this is a very, very lung-friendly type of uh, respiratory support and it protects the lung from getting injured, especially preterm. That's why, so all our uh, preterm babies, 
they love uh, CPAP a lot. It's a very very comfortable and lung friendly intervention. So uh, that is why now CPAP is considered the gold standard whenever we talk about respiratory care of uh, newborn babies, especially the preterm babies soon after birth. Gone are the days where our NICUs were uh, filled more with ventilators. Nowadays, even in my unit, uh, uh, we do have more of So, our primary form of respiratory support in any baby, preterm baby especially with respiratory distress, remains uh, CPAP, continuous positive air rotation. So, uh, that is uh, to insist upon the importance why we should be using CPAP and not invasive ventilation preterm babies. Uh, we just realize see, the pressure that is being delivered through CPAP helps in maintaining a certain amount of uh, gas continuously at the end of an uh, inspiration, expiration, what we call as a functional residual capacity. So the, that ensures that the alveoli are not getting collapsed at the end of expiration. So uh, if the alveoli are getting collapsed at the end of expiration, the baby has to put in a lot of effort to open up the alveoli. So this is being taken care of by CPAP, the maintenance of functional residual capacity, so the breathing becomes very comfortable. It not only stabilizes the alveoli, the preterm airways are very much, uh, they're very uh, soft and collapsible. So CPAP helps in stabilizing the airways as well as it the airways. And we all know that uh, one of the main interventions uh, in managing respiratory distress of a preterm baby is surfactant. So CPAP has actually even preceded surfactant. The use of surfactant has become selective. Surfactant is not the number one intervention for managing a respiratory distress syndrome. So all babies with distress are put on CPAP. CPAP helps in conserving surfactant. And even after CPAP, if uh, the lung, if some babies might require surfactant, only those babies are receiving surfactant at the moment, called as a selective surfactant policy. And of course, uh, it not only works at the level of the lung, there are some connections, there are some receptors situated in the lung. When they are activated, they stimulate the breathing ability in the brain, they stimulate the respiratory center in the brain. So that's how it mainly helps in even so-called central apnea, where the signals are not coming well from an immature brain. Uh, for a preterm baby and the baby lands up in apnea, even in that condition, CPAP stimulates the respiratory center. So it works in multiple ways. And uh, just to understand the basic of CPAP machine, it's a very simple machine. Uh, I'll be just quickly going through the various components of the CPAP machine. See, uh, we need to have a very good uh, blender. We can't use 100% oxygen. So, uh, because uh, it can lead to oxygen toxicity, optimal oxygenation has to be there. And uh, I think, uh, uh, Companies like Phoenix use excellent electronic blenders, which uh, are a very precise uh, uh, mixing of air and oxygen and provide uh, uh, the required FiO2 for the given baby. And then from there, the gas moves to a flow meter and where the amount of gas, that combined gas is titrated. And that goes through the inspirator limb to the baby. And uh, so obviously, uh, uh, CPAP is a high flow system. So we need to use a humidifier, uh, a sour control humidifier is preferred. We need to heat it to body temperature and uh, get it uh, humidified with a relative humidity of close to 100%. The humidified and warm blended gas goes to the baby. We uh, deliver it through an interface called, uh, there are many kinds of interfaces in use. What we see here is a binasal uh, prong. And then the gas comes back and uh, it, it, some sort of pressure generation is there. In a bubble kind of CPAP, actually the exhale, the expirator limb goes inside a water chamber and the depth of the tube determines the amount of pressure that is being delivered to the baby's lung. This is the basic setup of a CPAP machine, but there are different kinds of CPAP machines. Uh, what I just showed you is the picture of a bubble CPAP system. There is another type of CPAP called as a variable flow CPAP where actually there is no need of this water chamber and the bubble bath. The pressure is generated at the level of the interface itself. There is only one limb coming from the machine and that ends up in an interface attached to the baby's nose. And there are mechanisms inside that interface which generates this pressure. So this system has an advantage over the bubble CPAP system in terms of the work of breathing of the baby. So actually, uh, during expiration, this offers very less resistance compared to that of a bubble CPAP. There's a variable resistance during inspiration and expiration. 
So the work of breathing is more comfortable in a very low CPAP compared to a bubble CPAP. Of course, the third one is that uh, we can use the uh, your, uh, ventilators to deliver CPAP, but that uh, will be an expensive option. Uh, again, the advantage of uh, uh, devices like uh, Phoenix uh, uh, 300 and uh, CPAP is that uh, there are options of using uh, either bubble or variable flow. Both options are available in the single machine, uh, the Phoenix machine. Of course, you can choose a variety of interfaces and uh, of these various interfaces, what you see here, the most commonly used ones are uh, short binasal prongs or a nasal cannula, but now the mask is also coming up. So it's the clinicians and the team's choice uh, to choose uh, an ideal uh, interface. So just we see a, a blunder here, uh, but obviously uh, in the Phoenix and CPAP, these are all inbuilt and we do have simple controls to adjust uh, the FIO2. And uh, if you want to go for a bubble system, you attach uh, a water bath and the expirator limb has to go in. What you see on the right is the other kind, what we call as a variable flow CPAP, again, which is possible through a the Phoenix machine, where there is no need of this bubble chamber and this interface itself generates the pressures here. It's only in one limb CPAP. So this is a picture from our unit. Uh, we do we have uh, around close to 15 uh, uh, NCPAP Phoenix machines with us. We've been using these devices uh, for quite some time, uh, which our staff feel find very comfortable and user-friendly to deliver both bubble CPAP and the variable flow CPAP. I think uh, uh, CPAP's uh, clinical applications are mainly in uh, uh, these areas. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah. See, uh, in a, most of the CPAP is an intervention only for a spontaneously breathing baby and it's primarily meant for preterm babies in these three clinical scenarios. One, the babies who have a respiratory distress uh, soon after birth. Uh, we do have some ways of assessing their uh, uh, severity of the respiratory distress. So whenever the, somebody has a score that is close to or equal to a uh, score of three, uh, they become candidates for CPAP. Uh, uh, CPAP can be used not only for distress, it can be used for babies who are having recurrent apneas where they stop breathing. So because by stabilizing the airways and by stimulating the brain, it helps in uh, babies with apneas. Also, babies who have been managed with ventilators, when they come out of ventilators, post extubation, CPAP is an excellent uh, support system. Uh, so, uh, uh, if you put babies on CPAP immediately after extubation, uh, uh, it's a proven intervention that helps in uh, decreasing the chance of this baby failing this extubation and going back on the ventilator again. Some rare indications like tracheomalacia and phrenic palsy, uh, we are now finding a lot of scope for CPAP even in managing term babies. Don't think it is only an intervention for the uh, preterm babies. So even in term babies with uh, conditions like meconium aspiration and pneumonia, uh, there are indications for uh, CPAP. Uh, I think uh, I have uh, taken almost close to 10 minutes. Uh, so uh, uh, I think it's beyond the scope of this 10 minute lecture to go into the nuances and the integrities of how you practically apply CPAP and do the troubleshooting and all. I think, but I think fairly I gave any idea about what this intervention is all about, why we should all be doing CPAP rather than uh, Invasive ventilation, uh, this is such a uh, lung friendly intervention. And the basic components of CPAP and, uh, uh, and the machine, uh, the Phoenix CPAP, which we are comfortable with for providing both the bubble CPAP and the variable flow CPAP. And I touched upon the clinical indications and the scope for this machine. Uh, thanks for your patient listening. Uh, I think uh, over to the next person. Thank you.